Okay, so uh, let's pick it up here. So we have, um, so we just had a couple examples of over-exploitation and, and, and taking too many organisms from uh, an area. Perhaps one of the most classic examples we should talk about is this idea of Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions. <clears throat> By megafauna, the, the operational definition here are critters that as adults weigh 44 kilos or more. So big bodied things. Think deer, think bear, mountain lions, like those, those kind of large bodied um, critters. Um, the Pleistocene epoch was, it, we, we went for a long time and was dominated by different periods of extensive glaciation, retreated, uh, so, so, so expanding glaciers, retreating glaciers, expanding glaciers, retreating glaciers um, uh, over places like North America. Um, I've not updated this. I, th there's, there's every... There's constant new stuff. I think we just had a, a new article about this the other day. But basically, on the order of, of you know, at least 13,000 years, lots of humans uh, are, are, are humans have, are doing stuff in North America, right? So this is this is sort of you know roughly in line with the end of this last big uh, glacial maximum as the as the glaciers are retreating, basically. Around that same time, around this same era, call it 10,000 years-ish ago, about 75% of our large-bodied mammals in North America disappear. Um, this is the largest uh, uh, extinction of large mammals ever recorded, right? Now, we didn't have mammals back in the day of dinosaurs, right? So just to be clear, but still. But of, of our more modern-like fauna, this is the largest extinction until we started doing our stuff. Um, and it coincides with humans getting to the, the area. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about the end of the Pleistocene. So um, this is about 18,000 years ago. We're looking here at, at sort of the northern part of North America, uh, Alaska, uh, Canada, that area. And the blue here represents big, solid, huge glaciers, like massive, massive, thick chunks of ice, right? So this is 18,000 years ago. Um, it's, it's, as we go forward, it's starting to melt and we're getting on average warmer. And so the glaciers are, are covering less area. The, the classic story is that the glaciers open up and now it's easier for critters and people to get back and forth. And the old thing back when I was in school was that's how humans got into, oh, you can't see that. Why can you not see that? Um, uh, uh, peopling North America uh, through coming over from Asia, going through Alaska, over the Bering Sea ice bridge or land bridge, and then uh, coming down through the sort of Alaska, Pacific Northwest, et cetera, down into, into the rest of North America. That, that's the classic story, right? We now have evidence that, that other things were going on. That, that may well have happened, but that probably wasn't the first. Um, people following the Kelp Highway, coming along on boats and sort of just tracking sea otters were probably one of the, the um, ways people got to the, the, the glacier-free area faster. But regardless, people are, uh, uh, regardless who got here first, as the glaciers shrink, it's easier and easier for humans to, to get to North America and, and, and presumably follow large migratory um, uh, uh, organisms so they could hunt them and eat them etc so now the glaciers are opening up uh, 7,000 years ago and um, in this era we have a very diverse group of um, big things and so outside of California we have mastodons we have ground sloths we have all kinds of um, critters right really really diverse mammal fauna um, really cool uh, and a lot of these things are similar to things we have now, but bigger. A lot of them are much larger bodied than we have now. And in some cases, like 20% larger, in some cases, like twice or three times uh, uh, larger. It's important to note that the glaciers never got down to us here in Southern California, right? So, so they covered Oregon, they covered 
you know, the Idaho areas, the, you know, Washington State, all that kind of jazz. But we were, we remained in our region glacier free over the last big thing. And so our assemblages of large vertebrates were um, ice free for at least 100,000 years and probably hundreds of thousands of years. So that means we had a very mature um, uh, uh, composition of vertebrates. And the classic example here is the Rancho La Brea tar pits. Has anybody been to the tar pits? One. Super cool. Three, four. I totally recommend next time you guys go into LA, have a couple hours. It's really, really cool, right? So not only can you go to the tar pits, but you can actually, the museum is set up so that people that are processing fossils, you actually can watch, they're in like sort of a glass fishbowl and you can watch them cleaning up dire wolf teeth and things of that nature. It's pretty cool. Okay, that record, the record from La Brea tar pits, that's been accumulating vertebrates, been accumulating um, uh, uh, mammal bodies for the last 40,000 years. So it's a fantastic record of this stuff, which are being stuck in tar. Critters are stuck in tar and they fall into tar and they die. And so tar is, is both something that kills them and preserves their, their bones quite well. Um, this is what the tar pits look like right now, right? And there's some, there's some mocked up critters so you can get a sense of sort of scale. Um, there's still tar, right? There, there's, there's still pools of tar. Um, and then there's the museum there that you can walk through. Um, uh, in California, these are some of the really cool uh, megafauna that we have preserved uh, in the tar pits and, and elsewhere. So we have these um, giant mammoths. So this is, uh, these are huge critters with giant tusks. So think of like a big elephant. Um, uh, mastodons, we have giant ground sloths. Um, so we typically think of sloths as the three-toed guys that hang out and move very slowly in the trees. These guys are are mobile and walking around and very big when they rear up on their hind uh, legs. One of my readings for you guys for this week, there's some embedded videos and some are a little cheesy, but they're actually kind of cool. Some of them shows short faced bear and just to give you a sense of how big they are. Um, so definitely watch those short videos embedded in that uh, reading. Uh, we had camels, right? We had camels here, um, bison. So very much so Southern California would, would have looked like um, what you think of as sort of the, the African plains with all these crazy predators and, and ungulates and everything. So pretty cool. Uh, we had short-faced bears. We had saber-tooth. Uh, I should have brought my saber-tooth um, tooth to show you guys today. That was lame. We had an American lion, just like we had an, have a lion today in, in Africa. Uh, the most common thing are dire wolves. Uh, the most common thing in the tar pits are dire wolves. And so these are um, uh, a wolf, but a bit larger than our modern day wolf. So large uh, predators and, and presumably also scavengers. Okay, so uh, give me some ideas here. So why might, give me some alter hypotheses, alternative hypotheses. Why might, all the, why might we not have mastodons and saber-toothed cats and dire wolves anymore here in Southern California. The environment changed so it became a megafauna. So okay, good. So one, maybe, maybe the, the climate change. Maybe they needed a certain temperature or a certain amount of rainfall, and maybe we don't have that anymore. So maybe we, we can't support them um, from a habitat standpoint. Okay, good. What else? Okay. Okay. So maybe maybe the prey base of or the food base of some of these critters um, changed, and so we they can't those those populations can't persist anymore. Okay. Good. Somebody else had another one. Okay, so maybe the vegetation changed, maybe their food changed, and then maybe the overall climate changed. Maybe it got too cold or too hot or, or too freezing or something. Okay, anything else? Any other hypotheses that might explain why these guys disappeared? Competition. 
Competition? So, uh, okay, so maybe competition with like other critters, maybe? Or, yeah, mm -hmm. resources. Okay, good. Good, so maybe they were, they were excluded by some, some new invader or some more efficient uh, exploiter. What else? There's a big one, big one. So those are all good, but there's also a big one we, we, we haven't mentioned yet. Mm -hmm. People. So we showed up around when these guys disappeared, right? So maybe we uh, drove them to extinction. Good. So um, did we, were we the cause? Did we, did we overhunt these individuals and take more of them than the population could replenish? Or, or replenish as we look at the saber-toothed skull. Um, so you guys just ran through some of those. Okay. So, Interestingly, this phenomenon didn't just happen in North America, this happened around the globe, and we can look at this. So we can look at Australia, South America, North America, Eurasia, and Africa. And what we see is, when modern humans get to these areas, we see the megafauna change very rapidly. So when humans, around the time when humans get to Australia, 88% of their megafauna goes extinct. When humans get to South America, about 83% of their megafauna go extinct. When, as I mentioned before, when they get to North America, 72% of our megafauna go extinct. When we get to um, Eurasia, about a third of their megafauna go extinct. When we get to Africa, a smaller amount, only about uh, one-fifth of their uh, megafauna go extinct. And so we have evidence that once humans get to uh, North America, we start to influence the distribution of, of big critters. One of the things we see is that technology, as I mentioned before, technology is really, really key to overexploitation, right? So we see that technology start to come into play. Now, this technology isn't radar or diesel engines as we would think of like our modern technology. The big technology back then were, were uh, tools to hunt, tools to stab, tools to pro throw projectiles, etc. And things like this so-called Clovis point, um, which was a, a, a relatively new invention in terms of a stone that you'd put on a, a wooden shaft. Uh, and we have lots of evidence of um, mammoths being hunted by this types of, type of technology. So, so dead mammoths with these spears broken off in their rib, or these uh, uh, points broken off in their ribs, um, um, that type of stuff, right? Um, other, so we, we have some cases where it's really strong evidence that humans were hunting these things like crazy. We have other organisms where don't have strong evidence that humans were, were actively uh, attacking them. Um, these are big animals, right? So this is Professor Monsmo, which probably none of you have seen because he uh, only teaches remotely, it seems like now. But, um, but this is um, on a trip several years ago with, with Professor Monsmo, who's in the English department. Um, and uh, this is, I have him stand there for scale. So here's one of these, you know, big mammoths, right? One of these mastodons. And then to the right is one of these um, uh, ground sloths, right? These are big things, right? These are like double overhead things. These aren't like a, this isn't like a big dog or something. So taking these critters down is a non-trivial thing, right? I need something more than just me. And so one of the things these human invaders bring with them are, is culture, right? So not only the technology, but how do we go about attacking these individuals? And so, um, so there's evidence of both these critters being um, attacked and, and, and killed by, by people. Um, so in this paper here, well, I'll show, I'll show you some um, figures from, um, from about 20 years ago now. Um, we see a lot of critters disappear over a relatively um, short amount of time. So let's look at... Um, you guys mentioned climate change is one of your things. Hey, maybe, maybe the, the climate just changed and maybe that's why the critters disappeared, right? Maybe it got too hot or too cold or whatever. And so one of the ways we can reconstruct our historic climate 
is to use different analogs. And so one of the, one of the best analogs um, are uh, um, critters that live now, that also live back then, that leave, uh, that have memory, that have chemical memory. And so in this case, we're looking at, at a um, foraminiferin. This is a, a, a plankton, planktonic critter. And um, this critter is, is creating its shell, and it's laying down its shell based on the chemistry of the water around it. And so by taking modern individuals, putting them in controlled chambers, and changing things like the temperature, the amount of CO2, et cetera, we can grow those individuals in culture and then kill them and look at their shells and look at the chemical composition of their shell. And by doing this lots and lots of times with lots and lots of variability, we can determine, ah, when, when a critter was in 70 degree water, this is, this is the makeup of its shell. When the critter was in 70 degree water with this composition of CO2, et cetera, this is what its shell was like. And so essentially we can recreate the, the climate from back in the day by looking at these essentially skeletons of dead critters. Not essentially, they are skeletons of dead critters. Okay, and so, um, so here we go. So we can do that, and that's what these guys did in this paper 20 years ago. And so uh, we're looking at various things. This is, this is the isotope of oxygen. This is sea surface temperature recreated from, again, the, these, um, these uh, dead critters that we collected and radiocarbon dated. Um, and so this is uh, now, and this is in, this is in uh, this is in the, the era going back, so this is, this is back in the day. So this is old, this is now. And what we see is uh, we have different, um, different areas, southwestern Pacific, northeastern Pacific, et cetera. So each of these lines is a different area. And the colors here represent um, when uh, we see the change in megafauna populations, right? And so we see some things, like let's look at this pink thing, Australia. Australia, not a huge amount of change, right? Right here, at least in this region. So the temperature is kind of the same, right? Whereas in Eurasia, it looks like over this period of, of, of change of the megafauna, there's actually a really large swing in temperature. Everybody with me on that? Okay. <coughs> we can also look at other, another line of evidence, pollen. So we can look at the pollen deposited in wetlands, and we can <coughs> therefore look at the relative composition of these different areas. Again, this is South and North America, and the, gray, and the color bars here represent the periods where the megafauna go extinct, or, or the majority of the megafauna go extinct. And so some of these individuals, like here in Arizona, not a whole lot of change in the pollen records. Right? Others, like in Alaska, a massive change, right? Clearly the climate is change, changing massively in Alaska, going from not, you know, solid glaciers probably to all of a sudden grasslands or something like that. When we put all this together, we get a figure that looks something like this. So this is the takeaway figure. So everybody stare up here. Let me make sure you guys understand this. So here we have the different regions of the world. And then we have a representative critter here for each of the, each of the uh, areas. And the coloration is an indicator of our best guess as to what was the driver of megafaunal extinctions, okay? So here are our choices. Pink are people, are humans. Yellow is changing climate and just the warming of the retreating the glaciers and this and that. And then brown is, it's too hard to tell. It's, it's equivocal still, we're not sure. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so those are the colors. And then this is the timeline as to what's going on here. So this is uh, 50,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, etc. This is when people arrived. So in this case, people arrived here more than 30,000 years ago, um, etc. This is when extinction was the greatest. This was, uh, sorry, the, the dark here is when extinction was the greatest. And the, the bars here, the, the light blue bars, are when climate change was the greatest. So in some cases, like right here, climate change and, and extinction 
all happened sort of after humans got there, right? And others, and others, it's the climate change starts before humans get there, et cetera. The takeaway is this. For South America, uh, it's unclear. Unclear what was the bigger driver, climate or, or people. Uh, Africa, unclear what was a bigger driver, uh, climate or people. In Europe, it looks like climate was doing most of it. But note everywhere, and just about everywhere, there are people and climate. There, there's, there are very few critters that are pure colored, right? Most are a mix. So there's both climate change going on and people overexploiting these, these vertebrates. We look at Australia and it's almost all people. We look at North America and it looks to mostly be people, right? Now, this is an active area of research. Every few years more studies come out, right? And so there's an active debate. Is to, did humans do most of the, most of the, are they responsible for most of the extinctions or are humans just a minor part? The point is we had impact, right? Whether we were 10% or 75% or whatever, we were having impacts. So we humans were changing population structure and, and just extinction rates long before we, be, we figured out a computer, long before we figured out cars, long before we figured out roads, right? So this is a phenomenon of our species. We have the potential to overexploit, and we've had that for at least tens of thousands of years. Everybody with me on that? Make sense? Okay. And same thing, this is, this is the same thing. Okay. Um, another key aspect of overexploitation, as I mentioned before with the passenger pigeon, oh, sorry, is there, sorry, questions about that? Anybody make sense, everybody? Yeah? Okay. Um, another key aspect of this is when we're doing our overexploitation. So a classic thing here is some uh, organisms just naturally wax and wane, right? Some organisms are relatively stable, others go through different cycles of being relatively common, relatively rare. And so, um, uh, yes, so we'll look at here an example of fishing or overfishing, right? So this is orange ruffy, and this critter can be very long-lived. So this critter can be um, hundreds of years old, right? And we fry them up and, and uh, make fish, fish, you know, fried fish out of them because we think that's a good use of these guys. Um, and so this is landings data. So landing, landing refers to when we've harvested these, these, we caught these fish out in the ocean and we brought them back to dock. So when we get them to the dock, that's the, we've landed the boat and that's what the term landings means. So that's essentially we're getting ready to sell them. And so here we go. So here's some orange roughy data. From this, from this harvest. Now, originally, way back in 1980, not a whole lot of people were eating orange roughy. So people were, you know, we were this is a deep fish. This, this is a, a logistically hard to get fish. Um, and so uh, we didn't really have any full-time vessels going after orange roughy. But it starts to catch on and it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we start to see more and more people enter the the market to capture orange roughy. And correspondingly, as, as more and more fishing vessels are out there fishing, we see more and more fish being caught, right? And you can either express this as the total number of fish or more commonly how we do seafood stuff is we talk about the biomass, we talk about the weight. So this is, this is amount of fish in, in weigh, this is amount of fish in terms of individual uh, numbers. Okay. And so if, if we take this and we translate this, it looks like this. So we start in 1980, a little bit, and as we go through time, we're catching more and more fish. It kind of goes up here, kind of blurbs, and then it crashes, right? It crashes. As it's crashing, let's look at 1996. It's really low, right? 1996, we had 553 vessels. Everybody with me on this? And so th let's call that number there, 1996. That's about the same as 1983. 1983, this year, we had no full-time vessels. Uh, people that are catching this are catching it incidentally, part-time, whatever, right? So we have the same amount of fish being caught. We have no, 
nobody focusing on it, or very few people focusing on it, versus uh, 533 people focusing on it, right? So that's an important thing. And we, we refer to that as the so-called catch per unit effort. So it tells us something about the population when we're getting the same number of individuals, but here you and I are kind of skipping around the field and every once in a while looking around and counting some stuff, right? When we, when we remember to. Whereas over here, we have hundreds and hundreds of people that are spending all day long looking for them, right? That tells us that the population is different. You agree with me? So this is the landings data. This is the harvest, this is the catch, this is the exploitation. A lot of times people confuse this with how many critters are actually out in nature, and it's not. It's just the guys that we've sucked into our, our nets or our, our boats or whatever. So the, so, the peak of, so the peak of fish landings is gonna be over here, right? So we have this era when we're getting lots and lots of stuff in the late 80s, early 90s, and then after this point, it starts to decline. So the peak fish landings were then. Um, what do you think is happening here? Somebody interpret what they think is going on with this exploitation data. For me. They've probably found like the best spots to catch fish and they're just blowing them out like crazy. Yeah, we killed all the fish. We killed all the fish. There's no fish left. So think of it this way. What if this were, this, were, this were a number of trees in a forest? Start off, chop down some trees, no big deal, right? Again, our exploitation rate is way, way under the replacement rate. Cut, cutting a few trees, no problem. The forest is pumping out many, many seedlings, right? And then we're like, dude, that's great. I, this guy likes to buy my tree or my wood. So I'm gonna go get like twice as much this year and make twice as much money. Okay, boom, okay, good. Oh, burp, 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 burp. now we're up here. Okay, yep, boom, okay, good. Oh, well, dude, wow, I made a lot. Maybe I should, and then my neighbor's like, dude, where'd you make all that money? I got two trees. Like, damn, I'm gonna get two trees. And all of a sudden, there's this feedback loop, right? And so in this part, we're harvesting, 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 harvesting. The problem is probably right here. Do you guys see that or no? It's hard. It doesn't look like it. We don't count the number of trees in the forest typically. We don't count the number of fish in the sea. We count the number of trees we bring to the mill. We count the number of passenger pigeons we put on the train. We count the number of fish we put in the store. We don't count the number of fish out in the ocean. So most people look at this. Most fishermen look at this and go, ah, it's all good. It's all good, right? They're confusing the harvest data or the landing data or the exploitation data with what is going on in nature. It is not. It is not. It is not. It is not. They are, they are different. So then, now we're taking way too, at, the, at this point, we're taking way too many fish. We're, we're killing all the moms and dads. They're not making enough babies. But these, as I mentioned, how old are these guys? Hundreds of years, right? So, like, we, can't, we don't see it exactly initially, right? And I'm still pulling these fish, and I'm still pulling in hundred, big fat fish, right? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, great, great, great. And I don't see the babies. I don't, because I'm not taking the babies. So I, don't, I don't see the missing babies, the reduced reproduction. Now, I'm really hammering the population. Now they're getting really screwed. Now they're crashing. But for me, I'm still pulling in a ton of fish. Woohoo! Life's good. Uh-huh. Awesome. Maybe there's a little dip here, right? Oh my gosh, what's going on? And then it bounces back. See, it was just nature variation. But essentially there's, there's effect, the population is essentially dead now, or it's, it's heavily, heavily hammered. And so all of this production is stuff that was generated hundreds of years ago, or the vast majority of it is generated hundreds of years ago. And we're living off the fat of hundreds of years ago. Now we're harvesting, and now the capacity, the number of people out in the forest, or the number of people out doing the, doing the fishing, now I, have all my, now I have my vessels, and I've gotten bank loans. And now I have this big bank loan, and I have this big thing, and I gotta pay for my kids' school, and I gotta pay for gas, and I gotta pay my deckhands, and I gotta, pay, like, I gotta keep fishing, I gotta keep fishing, right? 
So the economic incentive is all to take more, take more, take more. And so now, as all of us, as our hundreds and hundreds of vessels, you know, 700 or whatever the heck it is, vessels are out there harvesting, now we're getting everybody. Now we're getting the babies, the juveniles, the adults, and now all of a sudden there's fewer and fewer and fewer. And then people start saying, what's going on? And the environmentalists start saying, you're taking too many fish. And the fishermen say, how dare you? It's nature. It's variation. We don't know. And, and meanwhile, we're still taking fish. We're still taking fish. We're still taking fish. We're still taking fish. And then all of a sudden, the population crashes. And we're like, oh, I guess we took too many fish, right? The key point is, we took too many fish here. Most people will look at this and say, we took too many fish starting here. No. Right? We're talking about a biological resource that there's fertilization, juveniles, the juveniles have to grow to an adult reproductive stage, those, re those dudes have to be able to reproduce, etc. So this boom and bust cycle is, or, so this, this is complicated by the fact that those fish populations naturally for their own reasons are fluctuating. So if we overlay this heavy pressure on a period where they're because of their food availability or something, they're taken down, it can happen even more intensely. Um, and so this is what I mentioned before, that catch per unit effort, right? So this is the catch per whatever, per person days, per, per gallons of gas expended. There's different ways we could estimate it. But the point is up here, for every little bit of unit that we put in, we get a lot of return. We get a lot of harvest. We get a lot of fish. But, it's, but we, can, we can see there's a problem because we're going through time, we're getting lower and lower and lower returns. What do you think a sustainable fishery would look like in terms of this catch per unit? Somebody sketch out what, what a sustainable fishery would look like. If we were harvesting below the level that would be problematic for the, below the replacement level. Okay, good. So it would look something like, it would look something like that, right? This we call sustainable because we're, we're, we're giving some effort and that effort is not reducing the long-term productivity of that, of that population, right? So whatever it is, 100 fish, 1,000 fish, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, we're able to keep taking that year after year after year and we don't hurt the ability of the population to add more individuals to it. So this is the goal of sustainable exploitation is to have this constant level and not be in an era of this purple declining line. Make sense? Okay. And we also want to buffer that so that when we do have a boom or bust, we don't, we're not taking too much when we're in the bust phase that would get us into a bad, bad cycle. So we want, to, we want to be less than the ideal, right? We always want to have some conservative buffer in there so that we're assuring the sustainability of the stuff. Okay. I have that lecture that you guys should watch on, on sort of history of whaling, but just as a real quick uh, overview, an example of over-exploitation, whales are another classic example of over-exploitation. And so uh, modern whaling history starts about a thousand years ago, um, particularly among the Basque peoples. And then the Basques and the Dutch really start going after the Arctic, uh, whales in the Arctic in the 1600s. Um, the Nantucket um, whalers in, in New England um, really start, uh, start this up in the early 1700s. And by the mid 1800s, um, uh, these areas in Massachusetts and New England are um, massively important. So they are sending boats around. It's a, it's a global technology. It's a global exploitation. They're sending vessels around the world, sometimes for two years at a time to harvest whales in all oceans, all, all ocean regions of the world. Um, we're harvesting whales primarily for their blubber, which we would reduce in giant vats on, on the vessels and turn them into highly valuable oil. 
Again, this was before we discovered petroleum in the ground. Um, and a whale oil was fantastic for light. So this was basically the way everybody lit the world back then. So the, one of the uh, wonderful properties of whale oil is that it doesn't smoke very much. You can imagine you're in a little dank, dark place, and if you have traditional tar or something you're burning, very smoky, very sooty, <coughs> can't breathe, coughing all the time, soot, right? Whereas whale oil is burning much more cleanly. Um, we end up, uh, a in fact, in, in some things like sperm, uh, the, the bulb and sperm whales they use to, con to generate sound and focus sound, that uh, oil is actually so fine that up until recent decades, uh, the U.S. military actually used that in their gyroscopes and satellites because it was, it was really, really hard to make a, a better synthetic oil. Now we use synthetic oils, but... But so, so oil, whale oil was, was the bomb, was what everybody wanted. Um, and essentially pursuing these, these individuals um, uh, led to their uh, uh, demise, right? Led to their populations being you know, crashing tremendously. And in this case, we're talking about uh, humpback whales that had the picture to start us off with. But um, this goes until we have um, uh, an international moratorium by the organization that was created to exploit them, the International Whaling Commission, um, a voluntary organization. Um, we've ceased the large-scale, massive exploitation of all these whale species now. There is still whaling going on by some countries, like Norway and Japan and Iceland. But for the most part, the, the scale at which whaling is happening has been reduced. We've not seen the massive recovery of all of these whale uh, uh, populations, species. And that's for a couple different reasons. That's because they're, they're oftentimes slow, they're slow growers, so their life history makes that a little bit hard. They're not, like, uh, they're not weedy. One of the bigger problems we're seeing now is whales like to be where we are. So a classic case is right off our Channel Islands where we have a massive amount of ships that come in, right? 40% of all the cargo coming into the U.S. comes in through the ports of L.A. Long Beach. So that's all these vessels coming from Asia and elsewhere. And one of the main transition points is right past our Channel Islands, which is where we have essentially all of our large whales are, are found at one point or no, one time or another in the um, uh, Channel Islands. And so ship strikes are a big problem. So just whales getting whacked by these giant, um, very large uh, maritime transportation vessels. Bycatch, so accidentally being caught by other methods like uh, lobster, uh, lobster pots and things of that nature, entanglements, et cetera. And then, there, as I mentioned, there still is some whaling that goes on under this ridiculous guise of supposedly do, killing whales to study them, which is crazy. Um, and what we see with whales is we see another, yeah. With the new, like, additions to the Foreign Commission? So, okay, so the question is, what about um, uh, the 1972 uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act and, and adjustments to it over time? So that basically has made hunting whales in U.S. waters outside of subsistence. So I spent my 18th birthday on a whale hunt in northern Alaska. Um, with a Nupiat fisherman that were allowed to take five whales uh, every year. Uh, super important for their culture, super foundational for them. They use every single part of that. If they didn't have that whale meat, they wouldn't be able to, it's where they get food and everything from. Um, and so, uh, so those individuals have um, subsistence permits to hunt, but they can only kill five whales. If they, if they killed five and one sank beneath the ice, they can't take a sixth. Um, so uh, so we, are, we do permit um, a traditional take of whales, but other than that, in U.S. waters, you and I can't take a whale, right? So we don't, we don't allow hunting. Um, much, most of the whale populations are outside U.S. territorial waters. So in those international waters in other countries, it's the IWC that, that sets the standards. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. 
So another key thing that we can see here looking at this example of overexploitation is what we call serial depletion. Serial depletion. You guys should write that down. So what this is, is this is exploiting one population, or in this case, one species, and knocking it down. And then all of a sudden it becomes rare. Okay, crap, what am I going to do? I'm going to switch to the next best one. And then I knock that one down. And then I switch to the next, next best one, and so on and so forth. And so this is what we see here. So this is, this is harvest rate of different critters, right? And so we see, so this uh, dotted one is, um, or so this is humpback, blue whale, fin whale. And we see that, that you know, some guys get taken, they peak, and then their, their harvest declines as we overexploit them. And their population numbers become rarer, so they're harder to get. So then we switch to the next most common one and then the next most common one, and then the next most common one, and so on and so forth. And we see this time and time and time again. Abalone, um, uh, different types of bighorn sheep, um, um, uh, uh, you name it, and this is a common phenomenon. Different species of fish on coral reefs and stuff of that nature. So cereal depletion. Uh, we took a lot of biomass out of the ocean with whaling. Let me just be clear. We killed a lot of critters. Um, we took, and so this is, this is um, a harvest in the northern hemisphere, harvest in the southern hemisphere. Not only can we have serial depletion in terms of species, we can also move around the different populations, and that's what we essentially did. We started primarily whaling in the northern hemisphere, and then when we knocked those populations down, we started looking farther and farther afield, and then we found Antarctica, this great massive whaling a, a, a fantastic area for whales, and so we switched to a lot of harvest in the um, Antarctic waters. Um, and so uh, we killed, industrial whaling killed somewhere around three million whales. That's a lot of whales, right? Particularly for organisms we don't think, they're not like, they're not like sardines, right? They're not like thousands and thousands in a, in a grouping of them. So this was a lot of effort. This was very technologically sophisticated, very methodical, and highly profitable for many, many uh, decades and decades. Um, and so this is where we are now with regards to whales. So, uh, or as of a couple years ago, but, but close enough. So blue whales, we believe before we started commercial hunting, we had on the order of about 200,000 individuals at any one time. Now we're on the order of about 10,000-ish individuals. Bowheads, we had about 56,000, and we're about 10,000 now. Um, uh, fin whales, we're about a, fourth, about a fifth or so of the size. Um, grays are doing fairly well, the Pacific stock, gray whales, and that we're, we're, we're close to what our pre-exploitation level was. Humpbacks are about half their historic abundance. Humpbacks are the classic ones that make the like the very pretty songs, if you hear a whale song, that's most likely to be a humpback. They have the large pectorals that are white, the big, and that was the individual I had at the start of the lecture. Uh, minke whales are actually perhaps doing better. So minke whales seem to have recovered. They're, they're a smaller uh, individual, they're smaller whale. Um, northern right whales are still really hammered. Um, uh, Sai whales are, are pretty hammered still. Southern right whales still really hammered. Um, uh, right whales are so named because, uh, because they were the right kind of whales. They were super slow, really big, and went close into shore. So back when we had very unsophisticated, unsophisticated technology to harvest them, they were the easiest ones to harvest. Um, yeah, and so sperm whales, which are um, the largest tooth whales, um, we believe we had somewhere, on the north, somewhere north of a million individuals around the planet, and now we're about, about a third ish of that uh, number. Cool? Um, so here's some of our local California whale species. Um, on the order of now about 21,000 in the Eastern Pacific, so our region of California. Um, and our blue whales are uh, now at about 97% uh, of their historic levels. So for our local populations, these two species are doing fairly well. So these are, these are recovering relatively well from stopping that over-exploitation. 
right? Again, I just showed you the data. Not all whales are that. I don't want to be Pollyannish, but we can make a difference, right? By stopping some of these things, some of the some of the, these stressors, we can recover these species. So these are not not solved, but I would say these are definitely conservation success stories. California gray whales and, and the populations of blue whales that live in and around California doing relatively well. Not perfect, still getting hit by ships and problems, but but way, way better than we were several decades ago. So that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Uh, and if you guys are interested, as I mentioned before, um, so you guys should come with me to New Orleans if you're interested next year and some of our field experiences. We also have our, um, we hopefully will be taking our, our class to Maui, the Maui Channel, where we use drones and other things to monitor humpbacks, um, mother calves, um, as part of our colleagues, um, uh, Rachel Cartwright's long-term uh, monitoring of these individuals in the Maui Channel. 